perspective on artificial intelligence. Kyle Polich is a data scientist and host of a data skeptic podcast. He studied computer science uh, and focused on artificial intelligence in grad school. His general interests range from obvious areas, obvious areas, like statistics, machine learning, data visualization, and optimization, to data provenance, data governance, and econ, econ, econometrics? There you go. Econometrics, yeah. Good job. Okay, you, you, we're going to expect you to explain all these. Uh, in meteorology, he resides in Los Angeles, California, with his wife, with his wife Linda, and their lilac crowned Amazon parrot, Yoshi. He's here tonight to talk about a skeptic's perspective on artificial intelligence. So please join me in welcoming Kyle Polich. Well, thanks everybody for having me. It's always a pleasure to come out and share some ideas with like minded people. As mentioned, uh, one of my main outreaches into the skeptical and, and humanist and atheist community is through my Data Skeptic <coughs> podcast. I try and focus in how data is affecting our world, things like AI, machine learning, and those sorts of stuff. So um, I thought it would be useful to put together some of my thoughts on what artificial intelligence means as it's becoming more of a prevalent idea in our world and what the future might hold. Um, I also realized, so I gave this talk initially, an earlier version of it, to the Bay Area skeptics. L luckily, I've been able to incorporate some of the feedback and stuff I got from that. But I also knew that coming to this forum, I was going to meet a lot of skeptical people, but not necessarily everyone's a skeptic. You're all skeptical about one class of beliefs, but you could be an atheist, you know, homeopathy believer, or moon landing denier. So I wanted to work in a little bit of, you know, some accompanying humanist thoughts as well to be appropriate for the forum. So. Um, why would a skeptic care about artificial intelligence? Well, ultimately, I think it's because there are claims that come out of this. People will say it's going to bring you know, human extinction and doom. Um, the second one, I can't actually say I've ever heard anyone say this yet, so I hope I'm not patient zero for this idea, but I'm sure the day will come when somebody says, there's already AI here controlling the world and it's all a massive conspiracy. Um, so we should be equipped to have intelligent responses to that. Um, another interesting claim is that AI will never exist and that it's impossible. We'll touch on that here or the sort of converse of that, that it does or cer certainly will exist in the future. Um, the last two I added specifically for this forum that perhaps AI will bring us some new enlightenment about existence or that it will be the moral end of humanity. Uh, these are claims I think we'll see in time and it would be good to be debating them now. Um, we talk a lot about this idea of the default position. You know, I, there's, there's strong and weak atheism, there's strong and weak positions in a lot of cases. Um, the definition I'm most familiar with for the default position is that it is a belief or lack of a belief that is preferable uh, prior to any evidence, or that it's a position whose claims uh, leave it free from the burden of proof. So saying like, it either will or won't rain tomorrow, I'm not really sure, that's the default position. You wanna claim that it will rain, we should have some evidence for that. Um, but AI is kind of an interesting and complex topic, so what should a rational person take as a default position, with, specifically with respect to claims of AI? Um, what I think is right is that the default position is that AI may be created in the future, and we, we have no convincing evidence to falsify that statement at present. Perhaps some will emerge, but it's perfectly reasonable to think that we might have AI. What would that mean to religions and religiosity? Ultimately, I think it'll have very little reaction whatsoever that people will incorporate AI, either ignore it, say it's, it's irrelevant to the idea of religion, or they'll incorporate another religion in some way. But a couple of crazy ideas along those lines. Um, it could be that this is the source to spawn new religions, uh, that maybe someone will invent an AI divinity, or that we'll have competing machines that output prophecies at you know, very fast rates, and then we'll debate which one is the most uh, divine machine, or something like that. So, we could certainly see you know, wild science fiction ideas like that. I'm sure there's a few good short stories in there. But um, ultimately, I expect that the religious re response to proof of AI will be that it's sort of irrelevant or that it's part of you know, the, the divine creation or something like that. Um, so where should a skeptic fall? I think there's three positions. There's that it 
AI will certainly be created, that it might be possible, or that it's provably impossible. What would it mean to be provably impossible? Um, I'm going to get a little mathy for a second. Uh, some of you are probably at least familiar with uh, Girdle's incompleteness proof. Um, other forms of that exist, like uh, Turing's, complete, uh, Turing's proof of undecidability, or Russell's paradox, that the set of all sets that, that uh, there is, you cannot define the set of all sets that doesn't contain itself, something along those lines. Or the most simple way of putting it, this statement is a lie. If these sound a bit like double talk, uh, trust me, they, these are actually formal mathematical proofs, basically that there are things that are true for which mathematics cannot prove their truth. Um, so perhaps in there, there's room for us to eventually establish that AI is impossible, that through incompleteness in some way, but there's really no convincing evidence for that yet that I'm aware of. Um, it will certainly exist. I'm quick to reject this because there are no certainties. Uh, as I'll try and convince you later, uh, it's within the realm of math, there's, as we understand science today, that AI could exist, but yet new evidence could emerge that shows that it's not. Uh, we know a lot about how the universe works, but I wouldn't describe, I wouldn't answer the question, why did World War II happen in terms of the superpositions of electrons? I would answer it in some more sociological or political science sort of way. So perhaps in that emergence of complexity, eventually will come some proof that intelligence is unique in some way. But as far as we can tell, it's really an engineering challenge. We just don't know how to assemble things in a way to create intelligence. So to me, the skeptical vote is that Artificial intelligence might be possible, and we have no reason to think that it won't be, yet it's probably not here yet. A um, bit about beliefs. Uh, I think a, a good skeptic is familiar with this idea of Bayesianism, that we have some prior belief that's uh, commensurate with what's known to begin with. We get new evidence, and then we update our beliefs. So uh, let's say that my beliefs look something like this today, that I think definitely AI will be true. Yeah, that, that could be. I'm mostly in the maybe camp. Uh, definitely not camp, I leave some room. I don't say that's completely off the table. What if I got some new evidence that uh, I, I, you know, maybe it was introduced to something that wasn't artificial intelligence and I was able to inspect it? My beliefs would update. I would say that, well, now I'm more inclined to think that definitely it's real because I have something that convinced me, but I'm in, you know, open to maybe, and I don't say definitely not a zero because I could always have been fooled. There's always some fleetingly small probability that something is contrary to my thinking. In the same way, I'm, I'm open to the fact that uh, Lee Harvey Oswald did not kill Kennedy, but there's an overwhelming amount of evidence that he did and very little evidence to the contrary. So something very convincing would have to emerge to teach me otherwise. Um, I've gone all this while without actually defining what artificial intelligence is. And I'm going to try and keep that up just a little bit longer. Um, I'll share an anecdote with you. When I was in grad school, one of my profs shared with me, uh, John McCarthy, who's considered one of the fathers of AI, came to visit, uh, came to give a speech. I unfortunately wasn't there for it. I know this secondhand. But um, the prof who was telling this to me had a slide much like this, went through some of re his research, came to a slide that says, what is AI? That he'd like to skip through in about 30 sec seconds and move along. John McCarthy stopped the discussion and had a 45-minute tangent about exactly what is the answer to this question, as should be his privilege. Um, He's not with us anymore today, so I know he can't interrupt me. Um, but for the moment, let's just say that AI is a bit like the Supreme Court's definition of pornography. That we won't define exactly what it is, but we'll know it when we see it. So let's talk about some bad questions to start with. These are some of my favorites. Um, you know, uh, what does the sun taste like? It just, it, it, from first principles, it's the wrong thing to be asking. Um, and anything that begins with, if the universe didn't exist, is probably a, a spurious thing to say. Yet there are also uninformed questions, which maybe are the wrong question, but in some way exhibit a kernel of where innovation or knowledge should come from. Zeno's paradox, for example, is the idea that uh, if I shoot an arrow towards a target, it first has to travel half the distance. Once it's traveled that way, it has to travel half the remaining distance. So it seems like there's always halves remaining, and I'll never actually hit the target. Um, you have to learn calculus to figure out why that's false, um, but of course we didn't always have calculus. Uh, other questions uh, we can point to about, you know, what happened before the Big Bang? That, that question may or may not actually make sense once we better understand cosmology. Um, so perhaps we don't really have all of the knowledge and vocabulary and, and information we yet need to really define what AI is just yet. But certainly we can say that it's when intelligence is exhibited by machines. That's a pretty general de de definition, and I've really just deferred it by saying, well, now what is intelligence? 
Um, perhaps we could say it's the ability to reason or to solve problems or to create new information. Uh, maybe it has something to do with consciousness, but here we are at a, at a, a nice establishment that serves alcohol. If we go consume a lot of that, uh, our idea about what consciousness is will change over the course of the evening. Um, consciousness is a, a spectrum, and uh, you know, it goes from zero to all the way, and it's not really clear where the dividing lines are. So I think to really define AI in a, in a robust and perfect manner, we've got to define a few other things that are uh, escaping us. But I'll talk about what I studied and what I most relate to when I think of AI. It's that you have something called the agent model that there exists this concept of the world, the environment. Um, could be our planet, could be something more simple like a, a chessboard, that the whole entirety of the game of chess is defined by the position of all its pieces and whose turn it is. Uh, you don't need to know anything more uh, beyond the rules of how those pieces can be moved. Um, so there's an agent, us, or a machine in this case, that's able to enact actions upon the world. I'm able to lift this, I'm able to drop it if I so choose, I won't, and I can get observations about the world through my senses that update, and this is the key part, my observations allow me to update my understanding of the world. So not only does the world exist independent of me, and I can't see everything in it, but I'm thinking something, I have a mental image about the world, and I update that, and I take actions in response to it. So I have some notion of utility. I prefer certain states of the world to others and I have beliefs about the true state of the world. Uh, I believe my car is still outside, although I haven't checked on it. It could have been stolen in the last 30 seconds. Fairly confident because I locked it and I have the key here and it's a safe area, it's there. But I don't know with absolute certainty. If I go out there and it's missing, my beliefs will update. But uh, more or less, AIs are functions that map the history of all our observations to some preference over actions. Uh, this fits the def uh, something that fits that definition is a thermostat. It has sensors that are checking the temperature, temperature of your home, and uh, when it's missing the, the you know, goal state, it can turn the AC or the <coughs> furnace on and try and drive towards that goal state. So something about AI, I think, is, is really in, do we have a, a rational agent that reasons about the world and interacts with it through observations and taking actions? So we got some honorable mentions, right? What are things that we've considered or could be labeled as AI? Of course, Deep Blue, that we'll talk about again in a little bit. Chess playing machine, Siri, you know, everybody, the Apple iPhone thing. We'll talk more about AlphaGo as well, but I really want to jump back all the way to 1770 and something called the Mechanical Turk, some of you are probably familiar with. Uh, it was actually invented a guy by, who was trying to impress the Empress of Austria, which I thought was a cool fact. This is a chess playing machine. And it's a classic case we still see in industry today where the, hard the hardware guys did an amazing job and the software people just didn't follow through on this. <laughs> um, you had this box where a person sat inside and we claimed it was a machine or the creator claimed that it was a machine that played chess but actually it was a human being manipulating some complex tools to do that. Now, a feat of engineering, let's not forget, but not artificial intelligence. Yet, game playing is something interesting we're always coming back to when we think about AI. Why is that? It's probably because it requires planning, it requires strategy, and maybe games are the right thing we measure and base something about AI on. Go back to tic-tac-toe. Anyone can beat tic-tac-toe uh, if you study the full exploration of the game. You can do this by hand. Start with the basic state and reason. What would happen if I went here, here, or here? Well, the follow-up to that is my opponent could go in any of the remaining spaces, and I could follow up from that. And you could follow this whole very exhaustive tree in a brute force manner, expand everything, and bubble up. Well, if we're in this state, we know that you lose if you go here, and you win if you go here, and you tie if you go in most of the spots, and propagate up until you find the optimal solution. And if you have a properly programmed computer, you'll never beat it at tic-tac-toe. You'll always at best tie. But tic-tac-toe is a pretty trivial game didn't require anything fancy like machine learning or heuristics. Let's talk about a harder game like checkers. If you've, uh, and I know a lot of people these days think of checkers as maybe a kid's game. I don't know if a lot of adults play it, but play a serious checkers player, they will smear you. This is a game of competition and people are very good at it. Yet it's also considered a broken game in that no human can be a properly built machine. There's, an uh, there's a software package called Chinook that you cannot, you provably cannot beat it in chess. At best you can tie it. And I want to give a, a little shout to um, a colleague of mine in the podcasting world who does the Relatively Prime podcast. There's an episode all about Chinook that's about an hour long, and it's just a brilliant piece of, of audio documentary you should look up if you're interested in the story at all. And there's a, one of the main opponents or main people winning the game of checkers uh, is a fundamentalist Christian, so it ties a little bit to our things tonight as well. Moving on from checkers to chess, of course, we had Deep Blue. 
We all know that Deep Blue beat Kasparov some time ago. So uh, Deep Blue is uh, very, again, a wonderful accomplishment in engineering, but we wouldn't call it AI. Maybe specialized AI, but not general AI. We can't go and have a conversation with it. Um, another quick just aside, I talked to a really interesting professor uh, named Kenneth Regan who studies cheating in chess that people might be using <coughs> algorithms to play chess. Uh, and I interviewed him on Data Skeptic as well. We talked for an hour all about it, but really cool stuff. He studies all the games that are, that are you know, documented and tries to see if someone might be getting signals through an earpiece or something like that, if they're playing too much like a computer or not. So this was all sort of old news when I was in graduate school, and uh, we were talking and whispering about how Go was the frontier, the final frontier. No computer will ever win at Go until, of course, AlphaGo did. Um, you know, just recently, actually, part of why AlphaGo was considered so hard is because it's massively complex. In, in tic-tac-toe, we had the nine spaces, and um, you could explore all the, that grid. This has 19 by 19, and uh, it's fairly dynamic, although deterministic. Um, AlphaGo runs on a large cluster of computers. I think there are something like 1,200, uh, no, 1,200 CPUs that are using to power this, and a bunch of uh, graphical processing units as well. It does a lot of different machine learning and deep learning and some fancy stuff to get this done. Another marvel of, of engineering work, and maybe we're inching closer to the technology we would require to create general AI, but we also still wouldn't call this AI. Of course, we have to mention Watson as well. Um, a really major advancement in knowledge representation and recall and information retrieval, but still not necessarily general AI, just something that's good at playing Jeopardy or maybe just good at phrase matching lookup. Another quick fun aside, the ELISA algorithm. Not everyone knows about this. It was a simple algorithm that people thought, uh, could we produce a therapist in just a few lines of code? <laughs> so more or less what it does, you go and you say something like, oh, you know, I'm really upset about my car. And say, well, tell me about your car. Well, it broke down and my wife and I can't afford to repair it. Tell me about your wife. And uh, it sounds a lot like a therapist if you keep this up for a while. And maybe if it gets into trouble, it can just go back to, this seems to remind you of your mother or something like that and tie into a therapist. It, it seems like a, an actual therapist if you uh, humor it for a little while. Of course, it breaks down because it's a little bit it's too simple. So all this leads to this idea of we have special and general relativity. Special is the case where we do something we might consider intelligent, like chess play. We build a machine that does that very, very well. But it's not a general AI in the way that I consider everyone here to be general AI, that I could approach any of you with a completely off the wall discussion, and maybe you are or are not an expert in it, but at least we can converse, we can find common ground. As long as we all share the same language, we can communicate. Um, we look at a lot of these special AIs and we say, well, those are, you know, you, the hardware was specialized, or you program something special for it. It's, it's just mechanical, there's nothing intelligent about it. And that's where I think the gap is. Uh, we keep saying that, you know, specialized AI is, is mechanized, that it's following a rote procedure, and maybe that's the difference between real and true intelligence. But that mechanization is true, at least as far as we can tell, of our own intelligence. Of course, we have to get to the Turing test. Uh, Alan Turing's famous proposition in his 1950 paper, Can a Machine Think? Um, the idea, I think everyone basically gets this, that you interact uh, with a computer or a person, you don't know which is which, and you're supposed to, at the end of a conversation, say, you know, are you talking to a human or a computer? The imitation game. So they run these contests for, you know, regularly, I think every year. Human beings, I think they're, the judges are asked to score people on a humanness scale from like zero to 10 of how human they are. Humans generally get like an eight which is interesting. Um, uh, I think machines keep getting better and better, but they're not yet competitive. Um, of course, there are some gimmicks along the way. People were claiming a while back that uh, one machine had passed the Turing test because it claimed to be a Ukrainian boy and please ex it didn't know English very well and please excuse it for when it said weird things. That's sort of the equivalent of me chatting and saying, I just took a bunch of drugs and there's white elephants here and pink elephants, so excuse me if I say anything weird, it's just the drugs. It's a cop-out, it's not really a passing the Turing test, it's a cheat. We're looking for something that's behaviorally equivalent, something that seems to exhibit all the same properties we expect when we talk you know, empirically to another person. Now if a computer's doing that, that means that it's doing it in a mechanized process. Now Turing, and I think I should read this whole thing out loud, um, it goes on to say in that same paper, I do not wish to give the impression that I think there is no mystery about consciousness, nor do I. Um, there is, for instance, something of a paradox connected with any attempt to localize it. 
but I do not think these mysteries necessarily need to be solved before we can answer the questions which are the concern of this paper. And I agree uh, fully that we can talk about intelligence without mapping out where, when, how it exists. A further extension of this is called the Chinese room paradox. It's the idea that instead of a person behind that other terminal, or I'm sorry, there is a person there, but uh, they're not actually allowed to share any of their own ideas. They are communicating with a person speaking in Mandarin Chinese. So they get the symbols on the screen, they look at those symbols, they have some way of then going and matching these to an enormous library of good responses, and then they find on this keyboard these symbols they can't quite interpret and enter them in carefully, and that as long as these books, this massive library of good responses exist, that a human being just needs to transcribe them, and it seems like valid responses from a, an intelligent person. So this gets us thinking, well, we have a human executing a, a rote procedure that could, in theory, pass the Turing test if these books are complete enough. Uh, adds a little bit of a paradox to the idea, but the way I look at this is that if these books ex actually exist, that if they're vast enough, they can really respond to any sequence of conversation and convince another person that they're coming from a human, that those are the encodings of intelligence put there by a human. So you've just kind of passed the buck down the line a little bit. But is there anything that truly separates a human from, uh, so actually, it is, exactly what Turing was saying, it's a different form of localized intelligence. We've moved around where that intelligence actually lies, if this is even a reasonable paradox to be considered. But is there anything computers can't do that humans certainly can't? Can we find a dividing line? Um, Alan Turing coined what he called Lady Lovelace's objection, uh, which is something that Ada Lovelace brought up. She worked on the analytical engine. She's a really important figure that I think is not as well known and appreciated in the annals of science as it should be. What I wanted to bring from her is that the analytical engine, an early form of computation that she worked on, has no pretense to originate anything. It can do whatever we know how to order it to perform. Okay, so the extension of that is that it can't create art. Uh, it also would mean that the, uh, an interesting maybe contradiction to that is that the AlphaGo team, although they consulted with a lot of master Go people, none of the people that created it were really masters at Go. They just built a system that was able to teach itself how to be really good at Go. Now granted, uh, Lee Sido wasn't just built by AlphaGo, it was built by AlphaGo and the, the hardware that ran it and the team that built it. So it's sort of an unfair comparison, but I don't know, maybe uh, art and creation are, are the real limits. Can a machine not do that? Is that the central question? Well, as an interesting aside, there's this cool site I found, deepart.io, that presents two images. One is machine generated, one is actual art. Um, I took this and I got three out of 10 correct in trying to guess whether it was human art or machine art. So uh, you may want to check that out. Your mileage may vary. I'd love to hear what people think. But uh, we also have to ask, can we, you know, can we simulate what the human brain does, which I think we'll all agree is intelligent, on a computer? Is there any limit here, something the human brain is doing that cannot be simulated by a computer? Um, nothing, there's nothing about ourselves that we are aware of that can't be modeled. There's no gap for a soul. We're very mechanical at a biological level and a level from physics. So is there something we're doing that can't be simulated? Well, we're generally, our brains are made up of these things called neurons. Our computers are made up of these things called transistors. They're not the same thing, but we can make a quick analogy um, that if we're building on these, can we make these run? And uh, if we can make one of these run, can we make lots of these run? And if we can make lots of them run, can we make enough? Moore's law is the idea that transistors are going to double every two years. And that was true for quite some time, up until 2011, actually. Uh, Gordon Moore, uh, in 2015, foresaw this, uh, that the rate of progress would reach saturation. He wrote in IEEE Spectrum, I see more laws dying here in the next decade or so. And indeed, it's been confirmed. We're no longer doubling the amount of transistors that could fit on a chip in a period of time. So, are we going to hit some physical limit? Is this where you know, humans are, are mystical or magical in some way that a computer can never can be? Well, I think Moore's Law is a distraction. Here's why. Let's play a little game. Um, I'm going to show you three photos of children in a moment. One of them is me. No one here knew me as a child. I think many of you only met me tonight. I'm going to show it to you very quickly for like one second. Try and guess which one of these is me. All right, you ready? Go. All right. Who thought A? One hand. Who thought B? Couple hands. Who thought C? Um, no idea. <laughs> All right. Seems like the majority is C. It is C. This is me as a child. I had a different color hair, so very tricky. But something about your miraculous brain was able to extrapolate and age these photos. That's incredible. And you did it in like a second, half a second, and mostly got it right. 
Um, are you, if we make the analogy of a neuron to a transistor, like maybe one line of code, how many lines of code could you run in one second? And throw out, you know, using libraries, which if you know anything about programming, calling a library can kind of encapsulate a lot of complexity in one line of code. Can a computer run a finite number of lines of code to do this sort of advanced facial recognition? Uh, you know, in serial, just one by one? Well, probably not, but we wouldn't expect it to because our brains are massively parallel. <coughs> We're doing this operation, some people call it holographically, and it's spread out across all of our neurons. There's no grandmother neuron. I can't go do surgery and make you forget your grandmother by pulling out one neuron. Uh, your memories of her and things about her are spread across your entire brain. Um, but uh, a neuron, and uh, I'm not a neurologist, so uh, excuse me if there are any in the room, I, I may not get this perfectly correct, but basically you have inputs in the dendrite and that there's some mechanism, some function in here that by which if, if you get enough inputs, the output fires. Well, we can do the same thing in a computer, and in fact we do, we call them artificial neural networks. Where there are inputs, these might be you know, numbers, pixels from an image. Uh, in the human body, we think of it more as you know, light signals from our sensors and whatnot. Some layer we call hidden neurons that are in the middle passing messages and interpreting the lower layers. And then some output, which you know, in, in the type of neural networks we use today is like a classification like this is or is not a, a face, but uh, could equally well just be the, the choice to move an arm away from danger on a robot or something like that. So if you build up these things massively in parallel and massively at scale, you get into something called deep learning where the first layer are neurons that just look at the pixel intensity. So think of an image that's you know, however many pixels by pixels, map those into individually, uh, maybe a grayscale of those dots. At the earliest level, you're just learning intensity. But as you move up, you can start to recognize features like diagonal lines, and, and these become primitives built up of the lower level primitives. Building on these ideas, you can start to build other components which you start to recognize eyes and ears and things like that build up of these components, you can start to recognize faces, or cats, I guess, as the case may be. So this is a, a very uh, promising and, and quickly evolving technology that's inspired by the human brain, maybe working a little bit differently, but doing a lot of things we, 10 years ago, might have said would require true intelligence to do. Uh, in fact, we can, a lot of these systems build uh, algorithms that can classify images. This uh, one in particular, this paper, image recognition uh, by, by these three authors, was able to look at this image and say it's a panda with 57.7% confidence. So it's not sure, but it did get the right answer. That was the most likely candidate. So people started to think, well, what is it actually doing? Can, can we trick it? Can, you know, is it really intelligent? How is this thing working? <coughs> When you have something, imagine these at massive scale, it can be really hard to know what any one of them is doing. And there are parts of deep learning that are slightly, I don't want to say mysterious, but uh, not totally understood. So uh, how did the system come to recognize this? Well, it, it did it by building up from these primitives and, and recognizing different features and understanding what maps to a panda. But can we confuse it? What if we added what's called white noise? And this was first done, at least to my recollection, in this paper, explaining and harnessing adversarial examples. So they specially trained this white noise, just random kind of colored dots, and then they took a low intensity of it and they layered it on top of this. So that's something you and I won't even recognize when I show it. Um, but this plus this equals this, and now it's a given, and at very high confidence. Uh, so you're able to fool these things. They're not perfectly intelligent, or at least not in the way we think of it, because you and I wouldn't be fooled in the same way. Clearly, that's still a panda. But uh, one criticism of this work was, well, this is just white noise. It's more like a hack than you know, a, an actual flaw, perhaps. So can we do something better than that? I had a chance to interview the primary author on this paper about the fooling images in an episode of Data Skeptic. They said, well, can we create things that are more than white noise? And they started inventing these kind of concepts where this gets labeled as a car wheel, even though it's not. This gets labeled as a computer keyboard. And you can kind of see it. You can kind of say, like, I see where you got it wrong. It's like a toddler, you know, like drawing the wrong conclusions. It's like, oh, that's very cute. You're almost, but not quite right. Um, these things have been entered into art contests and, uh, and, and have won. We have computers writing poetry. So I don't know what Ada Lovelace would think about this now, that we have uh, machines creating art and winning contests in it. But we should absolutely be celebrating Ada. I don't mean to criticize her in that way. Einstein himself made some mistakes and thought a few things that we now know to be true or not true. Doesn't diminish his contributions, nor Ada's. 
Um, it's worth mentioning, I think many people have seen this, Google's deep dream that uh, they're able to take parts of an image and say, what do you think might go here and create these really cool, trippy, psychedelic kinds of images that are very neat. Um, one thing I'll note, it's good enough for skeptics, I could not do this at home. It's not that I don't know how it works or I'm not smart enough, but it requires a massive amount of computational power and resources that very few people or organizations in the world can have. Google can do this. I can't, at least not in a cost-effective way. So uh, to me, the takeaway there is we're unlikely to have some crazy, maniacal, single person in a basement somewhere create an AI that's going to destroy the world. It would have to be a conceited effort of a pretty bad organization. Doesn't mean that such organizations don't exist. Just means it's not uh, as threatening as you know a single crazy person, I guess. Um, I want to talk about a physicist named David Deutsch, a brilliant guy. Um, I should read his quote too. Uh, he says that everything that the laws of physics require physical objects to do can, in principle, be emulated in arbitrarily fine detail by some program on a general purpose computer, provided it is given enough time and memory. So what's a general purpose computer? You gotta learn some computer science to get into this, so I'll try and be gentle. We'd love to talk more about this afterwards, but um, basically a computer is these three things, an AND gate, an OR gate, and a NOT. That AND comes out true only if both inputs are positive, OR comes out true if either, but, uh, but at least one is positive, NOT just flips it. And actually, you don't even need three. You just need the NOT AND gate, but I think this is more intuitive. People can kind of understand what these are. From these very simple ideas, you can build up an entire modern computer. This is all it takes. Computers are very simple at their core. They're just constructed in, in massive scales and very complex organizations to do really impressive things. But there's nothing about a, a computer that can't, or there's nothing about the universe, according to David, that we can't simulate on a computer. A ball rolling down, down a hill can follow probably you know, classical Newton's equations. We can compute those. The way a charge moves through a, a wire, we can compute that with Maxwell's equations on a computer. We can describe any system or any physical um, behavior of any physical object with a computer. We might need a very powerful, we might need one with a lot of memory or a lot of time, but there's nothing preventing us from doing that. So as far as we know, the universe is a little bit like a board game. It follows very predictable rules. We might not know all the rules, but they seem to exist. It can, all the rules we do know can be described perfectly by mathematics, and yet they often behave stochastically, which is why it's important I picked the board game with the dice, because not everything is certainly deterministic. There can be chance to it, but we can build chance into how we model the universe. So um, even though we might not know all the rules, it seems to be the case they can all be written down, we can understand all of them mathematically, and that being true, there's nothing preventing a computer from simulating the same principles that go into whatever it is that makes us intelligent. So simulation, is there any added, the, asking the question of, you know, should we be skeptical of AI really comes down to this question, what is it that couldn't, could not be simulated on a computer about intelligence? So here's an analogy I thought up, I don't know if this will work or not, but what if we had hyper-intelligent chimpanzees? And they said, we want to play basketball. I said, no, 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 you can't play basketball, you can't dribble the ball. Chimpanzee says, sure I can, I'm dribbling the ball. Well, you can't shoot a free throw. Sure I can, the chimpanzee can shoot a free throw. There's really nothing about a hyper-intelligent chimpanzee that can't play basketball unless you make a rule that says only humans can play basketball, which is just specious or whatever the equivalent of racism across species is. Um, as far as I know, they might be bad at basketball, but they certainly could play it if they were hyper-intelligent or just at least intelligent enough to understand the rules. On the other hand, like, Get out, Flipper, I don't want to have this discussion with you again. You cannot play basketball. You can't dribble. You can't get out on the court. So that's what we're asking. It, are, are, are we a chimpanzee or are we a dolphin? Because the, there is, or that's the computer, I guess, in this analogy. Is there anything actually preventing us, a uh, computer, from simulating intelligence? If so, we have to identify what that is. So I've been dancing around another word here, computability. What does it mean to actually compute? Again, you kind of have to get a master's degree in computer science to really understand what that means. I'd love to talk in detail afterwards, but I think I might enjoy that more than some of you guys. So let me try and give you the high level. Um, it all comes down to Alan Turing's work, really, in the end. Um, Turing said that imagine there's a device, this is a Turing machine, that has an infinitely long tape, a magnetic tape, where you can write something to, it, to the tape. You can read something, and you can move left and right. So maybe the, the, this reading device would if it reads a zero in a certain position, in a certain state, it says, well, the zero means I go to the right. Uh, the one means I go to the left. And any description of a mechanical process 
can be computed on a Turing machine. And as crazy basic and simple as that sounds, that machine can do anything your computer can do. Anything that is intuitively computable can be done by this machine. Oftentimes, is proving that requires jumping through some really pedantic hoops, but it does happen to be true, and this is not controversial. Um, yet, Turing also establishes that there are things that a computer cannot do. The most famous one is the halting problem, which gets a little bit back to that in girdle incompleteness stuff. The basic idea, if I could put it as eloquently as possible, is that uh, there could not be a computer whose job it is to decide if other programs will finish or not because you could always feed it itself into that program, and now you have this self renter loop. Um, it is rigorous proof, even though it might sound a little bit like double speak, but it establishes that there are problems that computers can't solve. Yet I would also point out that we don't necessarily know that a human can solve that problem either. There are people that say, well, from the outside, I can look at it, and I can establish the truth, but I don't know that that actually scales. So we would really need a proof that a human mind is doing something a computer can provably not do. That would be an interesting proof, and we have yet to have any emerged. Because what is the human mechanism? Well, we also follow the basic laws of nature. We're composed of atoms and, and, and molecules and all these sorts of things, and we know how those behave. Now, granted, we're a very complex system of all those, so the interactions are pretty complex. It might be very hard to describe uh, the, why a human does what a human does in terms of you know, the basic principles of physics, but nonetheless, all of our systems follow them. We're made up of known materials. Um, the neurons, the very basics of our brains, are very well studied. Maybe there are a lot of mysteries about the brain, but we know the fundamental building blocks. And while consciousness might be really weird, as far as we know, it need not evoke a new physics, but it could. And that's kind of the key to this debate. If we're going to have something interesting emerge and say AI is fundamentally lesser or different from, computer, from human intelligence, it's probably going to have to give us new, come from new physics. We'll talk more about that in a second. But this is a bit, uh, you know, you guys know the God of the Gaps. I call this the theory of the gaps. Uh, Roger Penrose says that there's a profound harmony between mathematics and physics, which I actually agree with. Um, Penrose's beliefs have been described, I don't know about him, by him, but by others as trialism, kind of like an extension of dualism, that you have the physical world, I completely agree, you have the mind-spirit-consciousness world, which I'm a little shaky on what exactly that is, and then you have the mathematical world. Now, the mathematical world is not necessarily, not necessarily woo, if you ask me. I mean, if you just talk about these very fundamental pedantic aspects of mathematics, things like Piano's axioms, um, you could build up mathematics from first principles pretty well. And in fact, I think it would be fair to say that even if the universe didn't exist, which I know is sort of a weird, specious thing to begin with, but math would still exist. Two plus two would always equal four, regardless of if there was anyone here to know it was two plus two, that two existed and four existed, and the operation of addition existed, and that they summed to four. Those things are sort of independent of us realizing it. Mathematics simply is. Now, if you stop there, I'm in agreement with you. <laughs> But it's very close. It's like Scientology in a way. Like the beginning stuff is all about like you know mental health, and it maybe sounds good to talk through your problems. But then suddenly everything you know is wrong, and it's volcanoes and xenu and stuff. <laughs> There's a dangerous level here of the mathematical world being independent, and pure. Um, being a, a truism, but there's a, a kernel of truth in that that I absolutely agree with. Um, my summary, if I best understand Penrose's beliefs, is that Penrose thinks, and I agree, that there is free will. Um, what he thinks that I don't necessarily agree with, or at least I haven't seen sufficient evidence for, is that it's located in microtubules in the cell that are right at the size where quantum and classical physics start to diverge. Um, so my interpretation of that is that that's mysterious, therefore it might explain something else mysterious, like consciousness, both weird, same thing. Uh, doesn't really follow for me. Quick side on this appeal to quantum. So I actually think we should not call quantum physics mysterious. It is, but really, it's mathematically precise. It's just counterintuitive. Let's replace the word mysterious with counterintuitive, because it describes the universe in ways that are strange, but not uh, indescribable. We think of probability in what we call the, the one norm, that uh, any events, the probability sums to 100%. Maybe after this I'll have dinner, maybe I won't, but those two things are, when you add them together, the probability, you get to 100%. Um, quantum mechanics is based on the idea of the two norm, which basically says probability that we normally talk about is just a number. What if we use complex numbers? You know that uh, A plus BI, the imaginary number, if you recall that stuff from your mathematics. 
Um, and if you allow that, there's a lot of interesting mathematics that can be derived. And if you also impose one more constraint that it has unitarity, that this is a rule on how the state of the game, the game being nature evolves, that it always complies with this way of, of, of transforming. Um, so I know I've done a great job of explaining quantum to you, probably because I, I don't perfectly understand it myself. Certainly I don't understand it as well as Penrose does. But uh, there's nothing mysterious about it. It's a, it's a fairly precise system. So we wouldn't say, well, quantum. And, and that's the answer for the difference. Um, I, I think we're also working now on quantum computers. And while we're very much in the infancy of that, we're like the Wright brothers' days of airplanes. Once you've got the plane, yeah, there's a lot of engineering challenges before we have 747s, but it seems like we're going to get there. So this seems to be well understood, and uh, yet we have no real connection to intelligence beyond some conjecture. But um, I want to go to one of my favorite people to read in the whole world, uh, Scott Aronson, who wrote this brilliant book, Quantum Computing Systemocritus. Um, quoting from him here, actually, I'm not sure if this is a quote from the book, because I've been trying to read everything Aronson's wrote, and I've been assembling a lot of quotes. So. Uh, this is from my quotable Aronson. I don't see any compelling reason at present to admit the existence of any physical process that can solve uncomputable problems, um, which is to say that there's nothing in nature that can't be modeled in the same way David Deutsch says. So uh, Roger Penrose says there has to be new physics, and I would agree. If we're going to say that there's some contradiction here, something new has to emerge. Of yet, nothing has, but it would be awesome and interesting if it did. So. Um, form of special pleading here uh, that you might encounter, especially amongst the religious crowd. General artificial intelligence can never be achieved because machines would not have souls. So I'm not saying you have to quote me, but here's my quote of how I'd respond to this. Uh, once we establish the existence and properties of souls, we can then debate about whether or not the mechanism by which computers make intelligence matches with the rules of physics that describe the creation and properties of the soul. So I think this whole soul idea is a big distraction for exactly this reason. Uh, getting into the sort of final lap of my talk, um, maybe we can discuss a little bit about it, it, if it seems there's no excuse or no reason why artificial intelligence might eventually emerge, that it's just an engineering challenge at this point, then what will happen when it does? Are there any threats we should be aware of? You know, it, will artificial intelligence hate us uh, in, the, in the way that sometimes children hate parents? Uh, will it be threatened by us? Will, will there be, a, this is a cool idea, another good maybe short story idea, that there'll be separationists, that they want to go live off in the wilderness somewhere and not be bothered and just have their rifles and you know, don't come on their land, that sort of thing. Um, I don't know, uh, you know, should we have, if we have robot chefs, are we going to be worried they have knives? Well, I, I'm actually more worried about a human having access to a knife, to be honest with you, because at least the robot can, we know something about how it was made, we can disassemble it. Um, I think I might trust the robot more. I definitely trust automated cars more than human drivers based on the empirical data about how safe they are. Yes, there was a person killed, there have been some minor incidents, but if you look at the number of miles driven, uh, automated uh, cars are doing much better than humans do. So, um, well, yeah, sure, there could be a, a stabbing robot, someone could create that, but uh, there could be a stabbing human being just as well, so I think it's a bit facetious. Although, uh, while I'm not big on appeal to authority, we should touch on some noteworthy figures and what they've said. Um, Gates says he's very concerned about superintelligence in his uh, Reddit AMA. Most of his support for this turned out to be appeals to authority, <coughs> although the good kind, you know, in a way like, if I quote uh, Stephen Hawking's about black holes, that's an appeal to authority. It's not true because Hawking says it's true, but eh, it seems like it's probably true. I wouldn't quote Hawking's about you know what's going to be in fashion in fall winter in the fall winter line, but you know take a physicist uh, and a claim about physics seems okay. Uh, Musk says it's potentially more dangerous than nukes. Um, that with artificial intelligence we are summoning the demon. All right, uh, Hawking says this could spell the end of the human race. And in a twist, I'll say maybe that's true in the, in the end of this, but not in the way everyone thinks. Um, that it could completely, uh, it couldn't, that we couldn't compete and that we would be superseded by it. Uh, and then you guys might not know, but one of the major researchers in deep learning, Jan LeCun, who's now at Facebook, um, I actually couldn't trim down what I wanted to put for him because he said so many good things, but the highlight here is he said, we need to solve the unsupervised learning problem before we can even think about true AI. A distinction there, uh, unsupervised learning is learning without examples. So something like AlphaGo, it can be trained by saying, here's a bunch of games that were played that lost, and here's one that won. Find patterns that separate the losing games from the winning games. 
Uh, that's supervised learning because you're supervising it, you're providing an example. Um, unsupervised is another technique where you say, I don't know, you figure it out. And uh, <laughs> it's more or less. Um, there are some good algorithms that do it, and there's been a lot of good work in that direction, but it's still not as advanced as the supervised learning techniques, the classic machine learning stuff we see. Another big name in the data science world, Andrew Ning, um, says that essentially he's worried about AI the way he's worried about overpopulation on Mars. And I, I think that's, that's quite eloquent. I, I tend to agree a lot about that, but not everyone would. Someone I respect very greatly, uh, Stuart Russell, uh, one of the major figures in the AI movement, says, you know, first of all, don't panic. This is some stuff I took from uh, slides I saw, what, but wasn't uh, able to see the actual talk up that he gave um, at the joint conference on AI in 2015. Don't take the media literally, which is generally good advice for anything. Um, and if we can amplify our intelligence, the benefits to humanity are immeasurable. True. Uh, but he also uh, levies in a lot of big cautions against the use of weapons. And I think that's really uh, truly the thing we should talk about with AI. That uh, if we put AI on drones, uh, sure, should we be doing that? There are ethical debates here. I don't think there are mathematical or data science debates, but um, we could be building very effective weapons if we choose to, and those could be, be deployed in ways that maybe we don't like the consequences of. Um, by the way, I've sort of maybe cherry-picked uh, quotes and ideas from people here. I don't claim to represent all their views. These are just my interpretations of their views. Um, what are some things that the uh, religions might start to say uh, when true AI or things that are very close to it emerge? Well, the obvious one, AI is evil and it's the devil's embodiment. I'm sure we'll hear that from one spectrum of the religious frame. Um, I think we can also equally well see the opposite of that spectrum, that AI is a gift from God that works kind of like the Star Trek Prime Directive, that eventually we get smart enough we can discover it and then it's ours to do with what we wish. Um, I'm eager for the day when we have some AI charlatans, that machine that generates new God claims every 15 minutes or so. Um, wouldn't even be cool if robots started inventing their own religion. Uh, I don't know, there's a lot of interesting thoughts about what could be coming, but I think we're a long ways off from these sorts of worries, to be honest with you. Um, I got to have Terminator in here, of course. So what are the chances of doom and gloom? I, I, do, I don't want to over-trivialize this. I think AI and weapons is something we should be having serious conversations about. And actually, those things are taking place. We have a lot of thought leaders that are organizing those sorts of things. But I'm equally, if not more, worried about uh, viruses that evolve into the medical science isn't able to keep up, keep up with, or asteroids we haven't been able to track, or frankly, I'm more worried about human intelligence than artificial intelligence most days. So while it's something to keep an eye on, I don't think we should be too afraid of you know, Armageddon by AI. Um, let's think of, you know, maybe I'm wrong, what would be a scenario in which robots might want to, or I keep saying robots, AI should uh, decide it would want to come and get rid of us. Well, this is a, a factory that's been accused of doing some major pollution. Maybe the AIs could say, look guys, you're destroying this planet. We want to live here too. Um, you're going to have to stop this, so we're just going to eliminate you. Well, it could be, I suppose, but let's think about what would happen uh, if, if artificial intelligence is achieved on a machine. Presumably, it's not all that different from us. How might we handle this if the town over was uh, having this polluting factory? Should we just go blow them up, assemble a militia, get rid of them? Probably we might have a lawyer send them a letter, uh, you know, maybe approach them, talk to them about it, pass laws, ask them to comply with the laws. If they fail to comply with the laws, arrest the CEO. Uh, if that doesn't, you know, at some point, yeah, sure, the military goes in there and shuts it down. But that's a long and slow process. I think if uh, AI gets out there and wants to be independent of us and doesn't like us, they don't start by blowing us up. They start by saying, guys, let's talk about this pollution thing. And perhaps they'd even have the solution for us. So um, I'm uh, not too worried, actually, to be honest with you, about what might come of it. I think, if anything, we'll just be irrelevant to artificial intelligence, or maybe we'll be collaborators with it. Who knows? But as of today, it's really technology. We're doing a lot of specialized AI. Uh, Gunpowder is a form of technology. You can make fireworks out of it. You can also make guns out of it. Nuclear power is maybe the bigger analogy, because yes, the impact here is pretty great. A lot could be changed by the emergence of general AI. But I think it will be a gradual process, and one that will have a lot of, at least a certain amount of forethought on. And in fact, maybe it'll be something that evolves in a cultural way. So some people have, maybe people in the room have pacemakers. You have a machine in your body controlling uh, an organ keeping you alive. We have brain-human interfaces that are very primitive, but allowing people to play Pong and stuff now. Um, I have three 
devices on me that are electronic that I consider almost a part of myself, in, in a, you know, not a serious but sort of a metaphoric way. Uh, I'm never apart from them, my phone especially. Um, if, uh, if this, so I have a smartwatch and then I have another watch that's a health tracker, which is kind of annoying because I have to wear it like a watch. If I could, if it was like a grain of rice and they could embed it in me, I would absolutely do that. Now, other people might disagree with me. My cultural ancestry is mostly agricultural people. If they saw my hands and the lack of scars and calluses, they might think me the laziest person around. Um, but I don't think of myself that way. I think things change even, I'm getting old enough now, where uh, I caught myself the other day saying, kids these days are starting to sound that way. <laughs> So, you know, maybe, maybe AI will become these robot companions, maybe they'll become our equals, or maybe the technology is going to develop in ways we don't expect. Uh, virtual reality, for example, this is an early model of VR. Uh, or let's talk about uh, our, our cell phone. Imagine if a, a person from 1980 just went from 1980 to the present, and I got to meet them, they saw me messing around with my phone, and they said, well, you know, what is that? I said, oh, this is my cellular phone. They said, well, how do you dial it? Where's the dial? I said, well, I don't actually dial it. I just tap on the people on my contacts list. They say, well, is the long distance expensive? Well, no, we don't really have that anymore. I say, well, where do you talk into it? I don't see the microphone. Well, actually, it's kind of a crappy microphone, so I usually have an external headset I plug in. They say, oh, well, the quality must be really good, right? Well, actually, the quality was better in your time. We do all this compression on it now. It sounds terrible. I don't actually even use, like to use it for calls. Mostly, I just do web and stuff. I kind of get annoyed when people call me. I'd rather get a text. <laughs> Why do we call it a phone? <laughs> I don't know. So maybe we're on some path like this. Yes, this could look threatening to some of you. Maybe this evolution is the, the robot replaces us. Uh, maybe that robot is us. Uh, I don't relate to this guy very much. I've never hunted and killed my own food. I eat meat, but I'm like this borderline wannabe vegetarian for like pseudo moral issues, but I can't really commit. Um, I'm old enough to know that even generationally things are changing. Um, I don't think that on the grand scale I can necessarily know what's going to happen. Um, if artificial general intelligence emerges, we should have serious discussions about are they equals? Uh, should they be our slaves? Uh, um, but maybe AI will express its own preferences as it, as it emerges, and, and we should be thoughtful of that. So, uh, concluding thoughts, I find no evidence that general AI can't or won't be created. It seems to be that there's a lot of indications of progress that we will have some semblance of general AI. Um, our journey for creating that is going to be an incremental process. We're not going to have a lot of overnight surprises. Some, like uh, AlphaGo might have been a big surprise to some people, but if you've been following the literature and you knew a lot about the technology used, it really didn't come as that much of a surprise that that happened. <coughs> Um, I think there's a lot of really interesting philosophical questions that, uh, to me, seem slightly premature. You know, like, what color is love? That, just a, a, an ill-posed question. I think a lot of the philosophy of morality, slightly too soon for some of that. But exciting times in those areas to come as this becomes more of a, a conscious thought and, and we have something closer to a generalized AI. And, you know, this analogy of nuclear weapons is fair. Uh, we have drones that are doing amazing things, and we could be putting AI in them, and that's something we ought to be giving serious thought to, but I don't think it's the domain of computer science or AI, per se. It's more uh, the social sciences that should consider some of that. So, uh, as I mentioned, if you like the cut of my jib, check me out on the Data Skeptic podcast. Follow me, and uh, thank you guys for having me. Any questions? We're going to have a few minutes for questions. Uh, I'm going to start over there, and we'll make it around. Hi, my name is Fred. I wonder why you don't have a slide that explores the parallels between just Darwinian evolution of species generating new species and putting AI into that process, because you don't see, you can't really see species change in micro time like you're trying to describe in some of your slides, um, and yet it happens. Um, to me, this, it's like getting a bunch of um, chimpanzees together and asking them to describe what the next homo um, you know, species is going to be like. Yeah, that's an excellent point. I think uh, 
the choice to not include it is maybe that I'm far from an expert on evolution, and I think this there's some distinctions here about uh, what do they call it, the anthropic era, that we're now at the point where species aren't evolving, aren't evolving as a consequence of nature, but as a consequence of human impact on nature. Although that distinction, is, while I think it's important, is also a little blurry because species have been going extinct for a long time, usually at the cause of other species. Um, we're certainly killing off a lot of them. We're probably the, the record in destroying most species, the human race. Um, creating other species is something that I think is taxonomic, taxonomically a little bit difficult to put our thumb on. We say species emerge from other ones, the tree of life divides, but as of yet, no one sat down and engineered a species. Or maybe we have at the bacteria level and things like that. But uh, is it Darwinian? It's hard for me to say. Uh, we are the product of Darwinian evolution, and our behaviors are therefore the product of it. So perhaps that falls under the uh, umbrella of Darwinian evolution. But some of it, I think, is semantics and the labels that we get down to. Um, but yeah, uh, I think the, there should be some inclusion of, of how we consider this from an evolutionary perspective in the discussion. This is more of a statement than a question. Um, there, at the beginning, you mentioned the religions. So there's a religion. I think it's Norway or Sweden, and it's based on, I don't know if they call it AI, but it's based on technology. The premise is that, um, I don't know if you're, you may I'm not familiar, really I don't know about this. So the premise is that, that the religion is based on the fact that uh, memories will eventually be downloaded into computer chips or hard disks or some kind of computer memory, mm -hmm. and then therefore they will live on in that entity. Hmm. And it be transferred to other mm -hmm. uh, another body or a, a computer. So it's yeah, a, a YouTube video is, is it's just a little segment of a YouTube video uh, where this creature goes to someone takes him to Norway and where they don't believe in religion and he's talking to all these different people and this is one of the, the groups of people he talks to. I'll have to check that out. It, it, it's really interesting. Yeah, I will say I am slightly skeptical of the upload your brain idea. Um, while I, I do want people to shy away from appeals to quantum, there is an important principle in quantum mechanics called the no cloning theorem, that uh, you can't copy something, you can only kind of uh, read its information once. So the idea that we could all at once take the whole brain and represent its state in a computer might be physically impossible. Um, I'm, I'm open to it, but I'm yet unconvinced. Um, one of the things that I thought was I, I was skeptical about is that AI seems to be being referred to in the collective as though when we create AI, as though uh -huh. there will just be one, or even when the machines do this, as though they will all have the same opinions or goals or whatever. Sure. And if they're intelligent and anything like humans, they clearly won't. <laughs> that, that's an excellent point, yeah. Um, if anything, uh, the day, at least if, if the, the current state passes in the future, it'll be the few privileged corporations that have the resources to create something like this that will eventually create one uh, and, and probably have some ability to bias it in one direction or the other. So, yeah, um, I, I say we in an optimistic sense. I like to think of all of us as being part of the human race, but uh, I know that, that that's maybe a little bit too optimistic in a lot of cases. And, and yeah, although we would hope that in the same sense that we're talking about general AI, that if something like that emerges and it has its own volition, that maybe it can question what it's told in these sorts of things. The same way we can, you know, people can break out of brainwashing and whatnot. Um, it takes a lot and a strong person to do it, but you're absolutely right. It's, it's uh, there will be a, it, it seems like an elite, yeah, the uh, society or group that's able to create this stuff, at least in the early stages. Maybe I missed it, but I don't recall you providing a definition for AI. Uh, yeah, I scored it a little bit. I, I think, uh, let's go all the way back. The closest I came to saying it's um, intelligence exhibited by a machine. So what is intelligence? Well, it's doing something rational and it's self-interested. Um, I guess the, the Turing test is the closest thing we have to anything that unless we can pin down exactly what we mean by consciousness and by intelligence, we're going to have a, a slippery slope definition. And, I think it comes down to these sort of ill-formed questions like what happened before the Big Bang. We don't yet have the perfect vocabulary for it. But if I have to give something, it's the ability to reason in a general case, to solve problems in a general case, and to create new information. 
Thank you. Good talk. Thank you. Um, on the subject of the threat of artificial intelligence, like from Musk, Gates, etc. Sure. Um, that's something, sorry, comment, not question. Um, something I would actually pick at slightly, that going back to the nuclear weapons analogy, that when uh, Elon Musk says, for instance, you know, I think AI could prove to be an existential threat <laughs> to humanity in my lifetime. Like, for nuclear weapons, that's true. If someone before the Manhattan Project had said, I think nuclear technology within my lifetime could exterminate the human race, it would have sounded equally crazy. You know, sure, 40 years is a long time. Like you said, it's not overnight. Uh, but I, I would not uh, necessarily be quite as skeptical about people who are saying we should be concerned about the threat this poses now. That's true. That's very fair. And, and I, don't, I didn't mean to downplay that perhaps as much as I did. Um, I would make the, I think the analogy to nuclear is strong, that nuclear is very threatening. We could absolutely obliterate our species with nuclear weapons, as of yet we haven't. Uh, I'm grateful for that, and I hope we see the same thing play out with AI. Uh, any other questions? Raise your hand. Raise your hand, because uh, I'll have to, that's how it works out. Oh, okay. One more question. This will be the last one. So my question is related to what she said before, in the sense that uh, multiple, there could be multiple AIs who could be competing against each other, Absolutely. just like humans. And I think Elon Musk has also, one of his open AI projects is to ensure that there are multiple AIs. Yeah. So what's your thought on that? I think open is the way to go. Uh, I'm a big fan of openness in, in government data and in algorithms and, and open AI and the, the gym system and all the other things they're working on. I think are really positive. Um, this is something that if all the hype turns out, or even part of the hype turns out to be good, it's going to be a major impact on our culture and our society. So it should be done in a transparent fashion where people can audit it and ask questions. And I think things like open AI are the right way to go. All right, everyone, uh, we're going to go ahead and end this talk. If you want to ask any other questions to um, Kyle, you just go up and ask me. Absolutely, questions. I'll be around. Thanks. Otherwise, <laughs> if you're able to stick around and help put some of this stuff away.